Every once in a while, the endless noise of modern life becomes overwhelming, and the only solution is to find some peace, a place to recharge the batteries and move at a slower pace. I'm Terry Davis, and along with my best mate, Adrian Hardy, we love nothing more than throwing a hammock and some cooking gear into a rucksack, jumping over the proverbial back fence and heading off into the middle of nowhere for a few days. Once there, we let ourselves reconnect with our spirit of adventure and a little bit with our inner child and experiment with build projects or wild experiments that give us a sense of having achieved something just because it seemed like a good idea at the time. So leave the wilderness of modern life behind for half an hour or so and join us. Welcome to Two Men in the Wild. Coming up in this episode, I show you how to hang a hammock using tree huggers, Adrian gets into a fight with some stinging nettles to make cordage, and Ben Orford demonstrates how to turn a log into a spoon using the fantastic tools he makes. Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Two Men in the Wild. I'm Terry. And I'm Adrian. And we have come this weekend to the beautiful county of Derbyshire, where we're going to spend four days at the Bushcraft Show. Yeah, the Bushcraft Show is a yearly run event uh, done by the lovely people at the Bushcraft and Survival Skills magazine. Uh, it's a fabulous uh, event. Uh, anyone that's anyone is here. Uh, there are stalls, stands, you can eat and drink and uh, shop until your feet fall off, basically. There's so much to do here. Uh, it's a shame it's only three days long because you could really spend a week with all that there is to see. Because the show doesn't actually open until tomorrow, we've got this afternoon to spend our time building our camp and making some videos for you to show you how we do it, throw in some tips and tricks along the way and just show you what we do. Um, we've got a good stock of stuff for making stuff out of. There's nettles for making cordage, uh, there's a nice cleared area over there, um, I think would be ideal for the hammocking department. Um, plenty of um, good tinder and, and fire making equipment and lots and lots of dead firewood around that we can uh, use for making our fire. Which brings us on to our first thing, which is to make a fire. So mm. with, uh, without any further delay, we'll get on with that. Whenever Adrian and I come out camping in the wild, one well, of the first things we do, usually the first thing we do is dig a fire pit and make a fire. The Australian Aborigines have a really nice saying, which is wherever men come together and make a fire, they also make a home. And that's something that really connects with us because a fire produces light and heat, it allows you to cook your food, purify water, and it gives a central focal point for a community to come together and sit and talk and share. So Adrian's been preparing the fire, so let's go over there and see how it's getting on. So Adrian, this looks rather elaborate for a campfire. <laughs> What's going on here? Okay, so the idea is basically that this is the, the fire that we're going to be sitting around uh, in the evening when we're doing our whittling and this is where we're going to be cooking. So we build our fire here and then when we're ready to, to cook and things like that we can actually rake the, the coals up there and stack them up under the cooking area. So why have you dug the fire pit rather than just building on the ground? Well, there is um, there's a, a handful of really good reasons for it, but um, first and foremost it, it helps protect the fire uh, it keeps the wind off the embers. Um, from an ecological point of view, there is an awful lot of seeds buried in the first for six inches. Actually, they go down a lot deeper than six inches, but the, the, the vast majority of the viable ones are in, in the first six inches. So what we do is we take the soil out and then put it over there so that it doesn't get roasted by the fire and kill the seeds off, and then we put it back after. So it's part of the, the leave no trace methodology. And there's quite a collection of leaves sticks, twigs, going yep. on what's that? Okay. So this is just the, the standard way I light a fire. We've got the um, uh, the tinder bundle here. So this is what some people call a bird's nest. Uh, then we've got the very fine sort of um, pencil lead thickness of, of twigs up to uh, about pencil width and then sort of thumb size and then onwards. So the idea is, as usual, we get an ember going, we get it into the bird's nest, blow it into a flame, small twigs on, medium size, large, and up we go on from there. And how are you going to create that ember? Um, I think this time I'm going to use a piece of King Alfred's uh, cake. Sorry, King Alfred's cake? What's, what's that? So King Alfred's cake is a type of tree fungus which I believe you get on birch trees mostly. I have seen it once or twice on other trees, but that's it there, nicely dried out. It's basically a fungus and it's basically a piece of charcoal. So that'll take a spark from a, 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 from a steel or from a Finnington steel or from a fire steel um, and um, Build an ember, which you can then blow on, turn it into uh, a hot coal, transfer the pieces of that, and off we go.
So as you can see we have got most of the camp up now, the tarpauling, the, the main shelter is, is up and we're now into putting the hammocks up and I just wanted to take a moment just to show you how I attach a hammock to a tree because it's slightly different than um, traditional methods. Um, most hammocks, well all hammocks, come with a, a piece of this on the end, it's a, it's a piece of cord and you see that it's, it's quite thick, um, it's like paracord. Um, a little bit thicker, um, very heavy duty, it's designed to take your entire body weight so it has to be. The problem with this is if you wrap this around a tree and, and you tie it tight and you put your entire body weight on it you're effectively going to garrot the tree and if you damage the bark all the way around a tree it's like the skin, it's like taking the skin off your arm, it's effectively it will open up to infection and bacteria and you will kill the tree so you do not want to be tying something like this around the tree and then put your entire body weight on it. So what you need is something called a tree hugger. This is a piece of um, thick webbing strap. Um, it's quite long in this case, as you can see, it's about, probably about two, two meters long. Um, the idea of this is it wraps around the tree and it will take the load without cutting into the tree, so it spreads, spreads the, the, the weight of, the, uh, of, of your hammock. Um, so it's this one, this particular one has got lots of loops on it, so you can hang things off it and you can make it into different lengths. Um, the reason I got this is because we started hanging our hammocks in some fairly robust trees and the ones that I had just wouldn't reach around it, so I got these really long ones. Anyway, to use this, what you want to do is you want to strap it from the front and around the back so that you pull both ends towards yourself and then you can adjust it just by sliding it around. Now this has got one loop on one end and then many loops so it's, it's multi-adjustable. Okay so now what you can do, now you've got those two loops together, you're not hurting the tree and you've got a good, fashion, good fixing point there. Um, you can just put your, um, your cord straight into that now if you want to but as a method that I've come across which is slightly quicker and better I find. Um, so this is a carabiner, carabiner, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's a proper, it's not one of those silly ones you get on a key ring, this is a proper climbing one from uh, a, a mountain store, uh, designed to take a proper body weight. So what I do is, is I take that and I clip that through into there. So you can see that, it's just clipped in through the loops. Now again, I could just tie off to that, but there will be a little point, so I've got these. These are climbing rings, again from the mountain store, um, and what I do is I take two of these and I put them into the carabiner. Okay. Like that. So they're just loose in the carabiner. So then what you do is, if you take your cord then and thread it through, through both of the rings, and pull up all the slack. Okay, so you can see that's, that's already, that's a good support there. Now, you want to take the end of your cord, and go back through again. Well this time instead of going through both the rings, split the rings apart and just pull it through in between the two. And that will give you something you can pull on if you get it right. Make sure you get your carabiner the right way around. And that will take the weight of your hammock. And you can do that on both ends and then you can go and adjust them. When you're happy with where your hammock is, pull it good and tight so it's going to take all the slack out of it and continue go through it again 
and then go through it once more so you've got a good there and then just hitch it off and you're done and that'll take your body weight that'll take it that'll take your weight all night long and that's how I attach a hammock So we finally finished setting up the camp and um, you can see behind me here what we've, what we've done. Uh, we've initially put a, a three and a half by four meter tarpaulin um, lofted over on some paracord over, over the back there, you can see just over the back. Um, the weather here is glorious at the moment, it's at 25 degrees, it's really really humid, it's really hot. The weatherman has, however, said it's going to pour it down, there's going to be lightning storms um, over the weekend, so we didn't really want to leave ourselves too exposed. So what we've done is added a couple of more 3x3 uh, three three tarps on the front just here and just here that, that give us a bit more coverage down to the floor and, and bring bring it out further for us. Um, and what I'm going to do is now take you inside the camp and just give you a quick show around what we've done. So this is what it looks like inside the canopy. Uh, I'm stood underneath it now, I've got plenty of moving around room, we've got an empty space in the middle where we can get dressed and move around and, uh, on either side we've got a hammock uh, both of them are lashed to trees at the back there and then they fan outwards uh, down either side to, to trees at the front so we've got a nice little canopy, we're covered, we're sheltered uh, and this is how we set up camp Oh, God, that actually worked. So, one of the things I was shown recently that I haven't actually tried myself, so this could be entertaining, is making cordage from stingy nettles. And one of the things that we've got here at the Bushcraft Show in great profusion is many, many stingy nettles. Now, I've always had a bit of a, a hate hate relationship with them. Uh, they're stingy, nasty things, but I've recently found that they can be used to useful stuff, so I thought we'd give it a go making some cordage from these fellas. Now, there is a saying that one should grasp the nettle. And apparently this means that what you should do is get hard of it, hold of it, and, and, and do what you've got to do with it, rather than just sort of panting around with it. And it is theoretically possible to get hold of this and strip the leaves off with bare hands without getting stung. So, the theory is that you do this. So you tease off the edge first of all, so that you, you're pushing the, you're basically pulling your hands up quickly like that to get rid of the spikes off there. And when you've done that, you should just, woo! <laughs> my god, that actually worked. And then, you can pull him out. I brought his friend with him, so I want to stick that one off as well. Well, I wouldn't believe that worked. I think I got a little bit on the back of the knuckles there because I was a bit not quite um, vicious enough with it. But there we go. There is a D-leaf nettle. The bit that we want is this layer on the outside, which is full of very long fibres. And in order to do that, you need to crush it first of all. then split it, there we go, and then on the inside there is this um, layer of uh, sort of pith which we get rid of and this bit that we're looking for is this outer layer here, there we go, so we'll just get a bit of that off there, that's oh, coming off really well and it's actually making good long strands and that's and so it's quite strong as it is, but um, apparently what you now do is let that dry uh, and it will shrink slightly and then you can make it into cordage. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a whole load of these uh, and then I'll come back to you when we've got some to play with them and see if we can actually go make this into some, some rope.
Okay, so you can see here now we've got um, all the, the uh, fibres from the outside of the uh, nettles stripped down and they're about the same thickness. I mean, there's uh, quite a lot of difference in some of them, obviously, and uh, someone that was expert at this would be able to do a much finer job at actually grading them. And apparently when you make them into cordage, the real thing is to, uh, the, the strength of the cord and the, the, the better cord comes from actually having a consistent length especially when you're joining the fibres together to make a long strain. Uh, but as I say, it's the first time I've really done this properly, so uh, lots to learn and an awful lot to go wrong. So let these dry out for a bit uh, by the, the fire and just let them uh, just just come get some of the moisture out of them and then um, we'll try turning them into some cordage and see what happens. Um, so we thought we'd just show you um, how to make a spoon. We won't complete it because obviously it will take a little bit longer, but just show you some of the cuts and some of the techniques and some of the grasps that we would use so that you can end up making a spoon uh, and still be able to count to ten. That's the idea, that's the plan anyway. So this is some cherry, suitable timbers for, for carving, for, 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 for certainly making spoons and things like that that you're going to be eating from. I would say cherry is great, silver birch, sycamore, anything that's a reasonably dense uh, hardwood. This has been split from a much bigger diameter log. We always try and split it purely because we want to try and allow the wood to dry out without cracking. These pool saws are phenomenal aggressive cutters. You've just got to make sure that it only cuts the wood and not your fingers. So make sure that you keep your fingers well tucked out of the way. And they only cut on the pull stroke. So concentrate on only pulling. And if you push too aggressively, you'll find that you'll buckle the blade. Worst case scenario, you'll break the blade. The worst case scenario is you'll cut your fingers as well. So they leave a really nice clean cut. So we've got a nice fresh end that we'll probably have as our bowl of our spoon. So. We've split out our blank. We know that it's not going to crack on us now. We now need to think about where that spoon's going to sort of come from. So I'm going to try and make it a little bit artistic. And because on cherry you've got this lovely heartwood and sapwood, this two-tone effect, if we carve the bowl into this side, you'll get this lovely sort of shape of concentric rings sort of appearing. So it'll look really decorative. So we use our little hatchet. Now when you're using an axe for carving, an axe that you'd be felling trees with or maybe splitting firewood with is probably quite different to what you'd carve with. This has got a relatively short handle. If I was using a big felling axe, I'd find that it would be too heavy and it would also catch on my clothing. So a, a nice hatchet that's got a stumpy handle is going to be a lot, lot safer. And we're going to hold the piece of wood at an angle and then we're going to strike down into the block. If we do it the opposite way, hold the piece of wood straight and strike sideways with the axe, it tends to move the piece of wood. So tilt that over, and I'm going to put a series of nicks into the wood, and I never go higher than where my fingers are. I normally stop at about two thirds of the way up the blank, and then strike down. It's far easier to chop halfway up, and then turn the piece of wood round, than go off to a and &E and get them to stitch your fingers back on. The next thing I tend to do is place where my bowl's going to go. So what I actually do is, I use an axe, but we could cut in there with the saw. And I'm just going to put a little notch into my blank, into my black blank of wood. And this is going to create the middle of my spoon bowl. So what I do now, and I've severed the fibres, is I can work back towards that nick. And then I'm going to actually use the piece of wood on the side of the chopping block and I'm going to use the very front part of my axe keeping my hands and wrist well away from where I'm chopping I'm just going to chop straight down in and almost straight away with those two cuts you can start to see that we've created that oval of what looks like a spoon and we're starting to get this sort of offset so increase that crank a little bit And the secret with woodworking is to take your time, plenty of cups of tea, and make a few nicks and then assess. I'm then going to create the nose of my spoon. So I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to take a bit off this front end. So that's creating the front of our spoon. 
and I can start to think about removing some of the sides now. So I'm going to bring these these inner edges in, and then we do put a few nicks in, and then we can start working back to that little slot. And once I get the axe in, I almost just lever and allow those fibres to do the work for me. So slowly starting to work down those sides. And you've got to be careful if we're working back down in this direction. If we go too deep and we haven't cut in deep enough in this direction, it's it's going to turn into a, a chopstick before a spoon. So go nice and steady. And so we can start to see we've got the front end of the spoon. We're starting to get this sort of cranked handle. So I'm going to just start trimming the bits off that, that don't look like a spoon. It's quite frustrating when I had a friend who was really exceptional at carving and I'd say to him, how on earth do you carve that thing that looks like a fox's head? And he'd say, it's easy, just take all the bits that don't look like a fox away. And the axe can be quite a bold tool. It can remove big heavy chunks, but it also can be quite a refined tool. As long as you hold it close to the head, I'm hardly moving from the elbow, it's almost all in the wrist. And we're creating what we call the keel of the spoon it's very sort of boat like it's got this lovely triangular section to it and it means that we can take it quite narrow because it's quite deep that's the sort of the plan so yeah it's gone from a log to something that's looking a bit more it's looking a bit more like a spoon really and normally at this stage you can actually take the weight off your brain and you can sit down for a bit so you can start to think, well, how much of this am I actually going to start removing? So I'll probably get a bigger knife at this stage and start to use some fairly powerful cuts to remove the bulk of the material. One of the most common grips is what we call the forehand grip. So we're holding it in a normal stance, cutting edge facing away from ourselves. And we're going to start working away from ourselves. Big mistake people make when they sat around the sort of campfire whittling is they tend to sit like this, they get carried away with a lot of whittling and, and then they end up cutting themselves. So I always say to people, just sit side saddle. It's sort of more comfortable. You get a longer stroke with your hand as well. So you want to try and avoid using your elbow. I've got chronic tennis elbow anyway at the best of times. So what I try and do is lock that arm and I'm going to try and lift from my shoulder and I'm going to try and drop the whole of my arm. And that's going to create a very long but very efficient stroke. Now you can increase the efficiency of that by angling the knife almost 45 degrees or beyond and you'll find that it will work like a guillotine. You'll get those lovely long curly shavings coming off and you're using this big shoulder muscle and you'll find that you could do that almost all day every day and it won't hurt you. So the forehand grip's great but my preferred grip for stop removal is what we call the scissor grip or the chest lever grip. So what we do is we allow the blade to swivel round so we've actually got the cutting edge facing back towards ourselves and then we lift both the knife and the spoon up in front of ourselves so one it's closer so we can see what we're doing. If you're doing it right you should be able to see the nails of your two thumbs and you want to lift it up get your arms close underneath your pectoral muscles and you're going to engage the blade hold your arms and your elbows close to your body and you're going to try and push your two shoulder blades so that you're, you're almost trying to squeeze a tennis ball between your two shoulder blades. It, I like to call it the chicken grip. Okay. <laughs> the reason why I like this more than anything, if you're whittling and you sat around the campfire and you're talking to your mate, you know that he's not going to get an eye full of knife. The other grip that I tend to like using for sort of profiling and getting long continuous strokes is what I call the fulcrum grip which again we can almost keep the knife in that same grip so the cutting edge coming back towards ourselves and what we do is we put the finger slightly in front of the handle now that distance isn't going to close because otherwise you'll cut yourself we're going to keep that as a set distance and we're just going to rock our sort of knife and hand on this fulcrum point and we're going to let it travel up and the safety is the fact that that finger hits the underside of that bit of wood. And the reason why I like that is because I can get these continuous cuts and I can follow a line and I can get very, very controlled finishes with a real nice degree of safety. It goes wrong if you allow that distance to close up, so you've got to almost lock that solid. 
The other really good grip, some people call it the pistol grip, I tend to call it the thumb, the thumb grip because you're basically going to use the thumb of your left hand or your non-dominant hand to apply pressure on the back of your knife edge so that you can actually start to sweep the knife round and clean up these transition periods between the back of the bowl and into the stem of the spoon as well. So we can use another grip. Everybody always gets taught never to cut towards themselves. We're actually going to cut towards ourselves now. See what you're going to do. You're going to push, push the spoon against your sternum, support the end with your fingers, and we're going to cut towards ourselves, but we make sure we point the tip of the knife away from ourselves, keep your arms close into your body again, and you're basically going to be safe because as soon as the knife and your arm hit your body, the knife can't travel any further. It gets dangerous as soon as it comes away from your body. You can follow through and you can cut your best get to meet in t-shirt then as well. So keep your arms close to your body and you'll find that you can refine that shape. A nice, safe action. But yeah, you might get a slightly bruised sternum after it. Now, end grain cuts like I was doing then. There's a tendency that people always cut and they use their thumb as a as a sort of end stop. Real, real dodgy. So if you are cutting end grain, you want to make sure that you keep your thumb tucked well away and you're cutting into this void. So there's no flesh to slice. Or you can use that thumb push cut again. And you'll probably see as I'm working, I keep alternating between the cuts. But hopefully you'll see that I've always got some degree of safety. I'm not going to be cutting willy-nilly. I'm always thinking, if the knife or the worst case scenario, the wood breaks, the spoon breaks, what's the safety? Where am I going to, where's that knife going to travel to? So I'll make sure that I don't injure myself. But what I would say is if you are carving, make sure you're not out in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows where you are. Make sure that somebody knows whereabouts you are, or you've got a mobile phone. And if you're carving, always make sure that you've got at least a good first aid kit with a few plasters and a few steri strips and don't start carving after you've had 12 points of cider, it's never a good idea. So you can start to see it's starting to refine from that log that we started with earlier to something that's almost got that crank in it. It's starting to get there. So straight knives, great for the outside profile, but we need to make it so that it can hold our dinner. So we're going to use what we call a crook knife. And I normally suggest that people start with their dominant hand. So this is a little right-handed crook knife. And the secret with using a crook knife is you want to take little bites, little nibbles. It's easier if you work across the grain. And I find that if you use what I call an open fist grip, so you're going to hold it in your digits like this, and you're going to have your fist almost open, and then you're going to clench your fist, and you're going to keep your thumb tucked well out of the way, and it's going to create this arc. It's going to create the shape we need and it's going to allow that blade to sweep up and away from our foot. Don't start right on the outer edge of your spoon because you'll find that it will struggle. Start in the middle and just use that little open fist grip and start to blade little bites. And as long as you continue that slice all the way through and up, you won't have any difficulty. The, the trouble when people start is they make a little cut like this and a little cut like that and you end up with this great big wall of fiber that you really strain against and suddenly it goes and then that's when you cut your thumb. And what I could do now is I could swap over a Blue Peter styley and I could finish off this one. So if I go over it now, it's probably at about four or five hours of drying and in this heat you'll be surprised how quickly it will dry out. And it sounds totally different as well. If we go over that, we can get a really nice smooth finish. It almost sounds like you're sort of carving balsa wood now. Really. Mm. So nice smooth cuts. And plus being a metal worker I tend to make it a bit dirty when it's green so if I go over it when it's dry you can get this real nice crisp finish. Take off all those dirty finger marks and make a much better job of it. Those are a few tools, a few safe, safe cuts, so hopefully they'll give you the confidence to just give it a try. Hi, so we're still here at the Bushcaft show and we've been lucky enough to see a demonstration of um, making a spoon from Ben Orford here. Um, ben and Lois, his wife, uh, from Ben and Lois Orford, who make 
uh, knives and fantastic axes and woodworking tools and Lois makes leatherwork sheaths that kind of thing to complement that and we own some of their tools and they are fabulous fabulous to work with and I recommend you check out their website which we'll put on the link down here so Ben thanks for sparing us a couple of minutes no worries. Um, as we're at the bushcraft show obviously the big topic is bushcraft what is it that's most important to you about bushcraft and the outdoors I think for me some people can almost get wrapped up in they've got to have the latest gear or they've got to have the latest tool for the job I mean for me bushcraft is just getting outside enjoying the outdoors you can have next to no kit at all it's just getting outside enjoying the trees enjoying the birds just being at one you know like I've got no shoes on now there's nothing nicer for me than just being grounded being in touch with it really um, just love being outside really. and how long have you been making Nice. Uh, making tools I mean I was messing around making tools even when I was a little kid I suppose so 14 I mean I found some old swords that I made the other day when I was like I don't know 8 or 9 and I mean they were only pretend really but uh, it must have been in me from the very beginning but I mean I made my first proper knife for myself when I was I suppose I was about 16 really and then I started working in the woods when I was 17 and probably sold my first knife to an Australian chap when I was probably about 19 so I mean you know I've been doing it a long time I'm 36 now you can you guys can do the maths I'm not very good at that but uh, yeah I've been doing it for a fair while now yeah. and of all the tools and things that you make what's the favorite thing you're making? I do like making the crook knives purely because they're quite a simplistic tool but they, they're so nice to use and obviously I love spoons. I mean I've loved carving spoons, that was the, my sort of first Greenwood love, my Greenwood project. Um, and I find that small projects like that, okay it's great to think I can make a bow or a birch bark canoe but most people aren't going to be able to do that. The spoons you can do in your front room, I even had a friend who lived in in uh, Medway and he'd, he'd carve spoons on his on his top floor flat balcony. I mean his neighbours weren't that happy but I know you I mean it's the kind of accessible craft really. So yeah I love making crook knives. And off the top of your head how many spoons have you made? I ate I think. <laughs> I mean I've lost count. I'm not like these guys that literally do spoons for their living like barn or uh, or even spoons that we met out there doing the demo. Um, I, probably, I hate to think. Probably at least at least at least a couple of hundred, I should imagine, and a lot of them have ended up in the fire. But that's not the point. <laughs> it's about just just doing it, you know, just having a go. I mean, that's the main part. Well, thanks for your time, Ben. We're going to do a scan round here and show people some of your knives and some of the Fantastic. That's that's great. Great. Um, thanks very much, Ben Orford, Ben and Lewis Orford. Thanks, Thank guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Worked. So, it's been a couple of hours since we took the, um, the, the the outer skin of the nettles off and we just had it close to the fire for a few hours and you can see now it's gone from the, those sort of um, wide flat strips down to this stuff that looks just like, you know, very thin pieces of wire, I don't even see that, but it's really, really narrow stuff. Um, and now we're going to try and make this into some cordage. So I've got a whole bundle of it here. It's still a little bit wet, it could do with it a, a little bit longer, but we'll see what we can do with this for now. So what we do is we take a couple of pieces like that and we overlap them slightly. Why will become sensible later on. If you can hear that in the background, that is the sound of somebody with a fire drill. And it sounds like they might be just about getting it right. If we hear a big shout in a minute, it means smoke has been made, so we'll find out. So anyway, back to back to the cordage. Two pieces of cordage, just set off 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 C2, run them together and pull one apart over the other so that they've got different lengths on either end. And then you take them and very simply you twist. And you twist and you twist. And you twist and you twist and you can see that you get sort of stripes forming in it. And eventually what will happen is it will do that. And if you let it go, a little bit more maybe. It will just start to form that shape there and that is the start of our cordage and in that just give it a little twist like that you can see it's now starting to form the thread and then all you carry on doing is going on putting a twist on each twist on each running it out twist on that one 
twist on that one, pinching it between my fingers, and on we go. You can see that's now forming a nice strong cord already. Now the idea with this is you, you would carry on doing this and, and pulling length after length after length into it, and I'll show you how to plait bits, some bits together when we get to that point. And then when you've got a piece like this, you can get two pieces together, join them together in the same way, and then if you want to, you can take two pieces of that, and you can join those together, so you end up making a cord. And the very strong fibres that are in here already, then just get multiplied up and up and up, and the twisting actually helps to um, spread the, 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 the loading on the string, on, on the cordage, um, across all the fibres evenly. It's really important, one of the things that makes really, really good cordage is that you don't have it going sort of thin in some places and thick in others, and that's the real skill to doing it, a skill I don't have yet. But uh, certainly through years and years of perseverance, I'm sure this is the sort of thing that you get really good at. So I'm going to just spend the next probably few hours and uh, just twisting this stuff together, and um, why don't you come back and join me and see how I get on in a few minutes' time. Okay, so a few minutes have passed, and I've now got a nice piece of cord like that, and that's already getting some strength in there, so that's pretty good. I wouldn't put a lot of weight on it yet because it's not dry, but certainly if that's folded over into two pieces, that's going to make some good thread. Now, I just wanted to show you how I go about then pulling in a new piece. It's uh, a bit of a thick one. As I said before, it's really important that you get um, a sort of continuity and, and evenness of the threads between the two. That looks like a good piece here. So there's my one piece, and here's my two pieces here. It's a nice thick one at the top, and this one's now down to one strand. There's the last bit of it there. So I'm going to take this piece here, which is a good end. I think that's a, I'm going to use this end, um, and then I'm just going to lie that one on top of it, and then just twist it in. Twist on the bottom, pin it with my fingers, keep that bit out of the way. Twist it on the top. Roll them together. And what you'll see happen is that this bit is now incorporated into that weave. And afterwards, I can just go and clip them off, and that'll be fine. So just carry on as normal. Twist, twist, let it roll through. Twist it in, twist it in, let it roll through, let it roll through. And on we go. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed the show. Watch next time for part two of the Bushcraft Show special when Adrian goes old school and attempts to make fire using the bow and trill method. We meet Richard Nisley Marpole, who allows us to try out his new prototype Bushcraft bow saw, and we get to talk with Bushcraft author and legend Dave Canterbury.